University, the voice of Reichman University. No, forget forget the rotting teeth, like because that's it's still that's abstract. Because it's still abstract to say, oh, it's rotting teeth. Because like you said, my teeth aren't gonna fall out tomorrow if I eat this candy or if I eat this cookie or drink this coke. Yeah. But if I see physically that when I drink that's this coke, I just consumed that much sugar. Yes. That's ingenious. Actually, serious. Amazing conversations from Israel, all topics considered, with Aaron Porras. Welcome to the Actually Series podcast in partnership with Audioversity and No Camels, the leading site for Israel innovation news. I'm Aaron Porras, and before we continue, remember to follow and subscribe for more of the most interesting and innovative from Israel with all topics and the wonderful people behind them considered. Today, the topic is something that you likely never pay attention to, but I promise that changes today. Uh, I'm here with economic consumer behavior expert and assistant professor Vili Abraham to talk about something that I myself didn't think I would be talking about for a long time, health food warning labels. But before that, Billy, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and kind of how you found your way into this. All right. So um, my, my name is Billy Abraham. Um, I've been doing research into consumer behavior ever since graduating from the University of Manchester, Manchester Business School. Uh, my thesis focused on consumer behavior and international marketing. It's more specifically about animosity and the relationship between, or really? to be more precise, the attitude of Israeli Jews and British Jews towards Germany and its products. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, I think in recent times, it's, I, I, you know, how much animosity is there left? Uh, well, this... back then, uh, my, my thesis was written uh, between 2006 and 2012, so it was still relatively high, but now... Really? A lot lower. But, you know, if you look at uh, first-generation survivors, it's still very high. Yeah, it's well, that, modest. That makes more sense. Yeah. It's modest uh, among the second-generation Holocaust survivors. Right. And, of course, very low among the third generation. But, you know, a lot of people I speak to, um, people my age, around 40, right. 45, um, they not only avoid buying German products, but they say we'll never step, our foot will never step on the land uh, no in Germany. No kidding. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I think that if we, you know, this is just a personal note. I've been to Germany many times. My wife's family is German. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I, I have never, I've seen it. I've seen it on social media. I've seen it online. And I've read the news stories. And, and, and I think that if I were to hold Germany today to that same standard, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to go to the States. I wouldn't be able to go to the UK. I wouldn't be, you know, the... It's the 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 anti-Semitism is pretty much everywhere at this point. Uh, yeah, yeah. Holocaust survivors uh, harbor animosity not only towards Germany, but some of them also towards the UK, because they were held in encampments. You know, the ones sure. after World War II, they wanted to enter the land of Palestine, uh, but they were held back and they right. were put in prisons encampments in Cyprus. Turned back, you know, on the shores of Tel Aviv. Yes, yeah. I'm uh, acquainted. Uh, I have been um, privileged to be acquainted with uh, one of s survivor of the Holocaust. He's a very uh, well-known uh, researcher in tourism. Wow. And he was held there with his family. No in kidding. In one of those encampments, yes. And he told me a very um, sad story. They wanted to come to the land of Israel, or Palestine then, with $5,000. And his parents gave him those five thousand dollars that it was held in his guitar, and he was just holding it when walking, you know, there uh, in this encampment. Until one day, one of the uh, uh, guards, the soldiers there, said, "What do you have in your guitar? You know, you hold it so close to your chest every morning. Give it to me." And just he had give, to give, it, give up. it to me. Yeah, he had to give it up, and they lost their money. They came to the land of Israel or Palestine with oh, zero dollars. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It was a lot of money then, a fortune. All right. Well, so, so he definitely does not like uh, right. the British. Well, so okay. So you've been talking about consumer behaviors and uh, I guess animosity, animo animosity in <laughs> yeah. general. Uh, how does that then work into this new study? I understand your your co-researcher, co-author of a new study that's looking at health food warning labels that apparently has has been ignoring sugar. And I, for the life of me, I've re I read, you know, the brief on your on your study. I, for the life of me, cannot understand why sugar would be ignored when, you know, there the whole 
sugar versus fat conspiracy goes back over 50 years. Yeah. Like, have we not learned? Is the, is, is big sugar still watching? Like what's going <laughs> on? Well, um, I came across uh, a study that uh, point to um, a dearth or shortage in studies that examine the effects of health warning labels in, not, well, in food in general, but specifically food that is sh- that has sugar added to it. Uh, and since my field is decision making or consumer behavior in general, I found it very interesting. And I called my colleague from Germany and I said, "Let's do it. <laughs> what do you think?" <laughs> so it's a German colleague, Kirsten Bramser, and another one from Israel, Lior Solomovich, uh, which is a lecturer in my department. Um, and it's a very fascinating topic. Uh, it's a fascinating topic because it seems that if you look at government policies today, um, they're not about education. They're more about preventing you from consuming sugar by imposing taxes on sodas, for example. And right. If you look in Europe and the United States, there's yeah. a sugar tax. Yeah. Uh, in Israel, they just have this standard label, which apparently doesn't do much. The, uh, the big red yes. you know, sugar yeah. spoon or whatever. Do, doesn't it, though? I mean, I know for, for myself and you know my family and the people that I know, you know, we still buy certain sugary things, but... But we do look for the alternatives without the exactly. label. Yeah. So you do look for the alternatives. But our study shows that if you use uh, pictures, for example, in our study, well, let's go back maybe uh, a step back yeah. into my study to explain. Uh, we conducted an experiment. Uh, we had three groups. Uh, one of them were exposed to the standard label. Um, we, we, we explored, you know, we did this investigation in, um, with uh, Israeli consumers. So about 270 of them were exposed to a cookie box with the standard label. 270 more were exposed to a cookie box with decaying teeth. (laughs) Okay. And 270 more, more or less, these are the numbers. Decaying teeth plus a line line that says uh, excessive consumption of sugar can lead to tooth decay. And we right. wanted to see the differences in risk perception and motivation to reduce consumption. And apparently, when you use a picture, the decaying teeth, together with the text that says, you know... The education, yeah. yeah. Why, why are there decaying teeth on my cookies? Exactly. This reduces... Uh, re- uh, this, first of all, increases uh, risk perception. It increases negative emotion regarding the product and also is more likely to decrease consumption of such products. So... I mean, this, I mean, this reminds me of the of the anti smoking labels that were brought into, I think, Australia. Yeah, that's where we got our inspiration from. By Interesting. Way. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, is that? I mean, is it? Is it fair to to? I don't want to say malign because sugar obviously does have a lot of these averse health risks. But you know, should a box of cookies be put on the same standard as a box of cigarettes? No, but I think that if you want to reduce consumption, look, uh, sugar causes a lot of social and economic repercussions, right? There are a lot of consequences. First of all, socially, obesity leads to many, many diseases, right. including cancer, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we're, we're acquainted with it. And unfortunately, around the world, the states, uh, here in Israel, there are more and more obese. If you walk around the street, especially right. in the summer, you can see that there are more and more teenagers who are definitely overweight, and probably obese. And it's because of the consumption of sugar and and snacks in general. So I think that if you really want to influence decision-making of the parents, who are usually the ones who make the decisions up to a certain age, Mm -hmm. you want to be a little bit more, how should I say, maybe a little bit more assertive in the messages that you're trying to send. Um, Because if you just use the regular, you know, label, then people continue consuming, although less frequently. I have to say that there is a decrease. Right. But if you really want to, people to stop uh, consuming unhealthy cookies, look, there are a lot of alternatives. Um, and if you have, um, sure. you know, you want something sweet, you can eat dried fruit, for example, and other alternatives. It's part of the education, uh, which I think has to start in school, but also at home. It, I mean, I, I, keep, I keep thinking of how, I, I don't know, of how a company might, try to get around this because and that brings me back to you know the beginning of this conversation with you know big sugar if if, if you want to call it that uh and the whole fight between warnings against sugar and fat 
did you did your study maybe look at any of that? Did have have you yourself looked at uh, at consumer behaviors when it comes to uh, ideologies and perceptions of uh, dietary issues like that? No, we haven't looked at differences. We focus specifically on uh, on sugar. Mm-hmm. Uh, although it would be, be interesting to see if there are different warning labels, which one would be more effective in uh, in you know in helping you choose something else. But I have to say, you know. If you look at health warning labels in wine, for example, mm-hmm. they have them in France, but people are against it. Why? Because part of the culture is having a glass of wine in the evening. So there are some cultures where labels will not help in what's, any way. What's the label on the wine? Like, what is that? It just you know, like it's, a it's, black it's, liver, or what is that? No, it's usually just text saying that you know excessive consumption of uh, alcohol can be dangerous to your health. What's the problem with that? You have that. Pretty much everywhere I can think of. Yeah, but it's less effective in France, and it's even not acceptable by the local population because they're saying, why are you telling me not to consume wine? It's part of my culture, and I actually think that it's healthy to have a glass of wine in the evening, although there are studies that show that alcohol is really bad for you, even in small amounts. Really? So regarding the cookies in Israel, although you know people were really shocked and they said, I, I probably consume less cookies, but we found that the cultural views and the social norms dictate what you will offer your, you know, your guests. So it doesn't look like people will not offer cookies because it's part of, you know, being mm-hmm. uh, hospitable. Well, so that hospi- hospitality, which is, as you alluded to, is really central to Middle Eastern culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and in Israel, obviously, there's no exception there. But I, I think that that the culture of what you put on the table has changed. Yes. Because it wasn't, and I, you know, I hate to malign any one country, but I think it, it's coming from America and, and Western countries like that, because that, that diet is being exported globally, really. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing a huge excess of meat eaters and cultures around the world that didn't used to eat so much red meat. Yeah. We're seeing, you know, junk food being consumed at, at higher rates. So is Israel... I don't know, where is Israel in, in the cultural shift, on, on the timeline of the cultural shift? And is there anything really that you could do to turn back towards, you know, put some fruit and vegetables on the table and some hard-boiled eggs as opposed to a store-bought cake? Well, according to our research and our sample of about 900 Israelis, they think that it's part of the culture and it doesn't look like they'll stop offering cookies. Now, I have to say in gatherings that I attend, let's say mm-hmm. at work, there are always cookies. They're always on the table along with fruit. But usually people don't take, you know, they don't eat these uh, cookies that are offered because they know they're not healthy. But it seems to really, really be something that is really deep into the, in the culture, you know, offering, at least putting it on the table. Sure. Well, so, well and where, where, do you, where do you fall then on the idea of putting this education maybe into a school as opposed to on the shelf and on the box, because it seems like it, you know, if I take that same example and I say, Hey, you know, I went to, I went to some house party and they put cookies on the table. And then right next to that, they put the fruit and most people ate the fruit. So it seems to me that the education there is working because there's no, there's no decaying mouth on the cookies (laughs) at this gathering. Exactly. I, I think it's part of uh, education, health education. You know, I remember myself uh, being a, a student in the States, and we had this, uh, um, I think it was um, part of sex education, if I'm not mistaken, but we had a class where we also had lessons about drugs and why drugs mm-hmm. are bad and you can get addicted, and they showed you, you know, what happens if you sniff uh, uh, cocaine, etc. So I think that if there are classes in Israel where they show what the consequences are of excessive sugar, and what other alternatives you have, you know, in order to quench, quench your uh, desire to have something sweet? How do you ba- make how do you balance that education um, with realism as well? And I'll give you an example with drugs. When I was in high school, we had you know we had to take certain health classes, and and that's all well and good. But I remember that when I was in high school, I had a health class that dove into drugs and alcohol, and I know for a fact that what they posited to us was a gross exaggeration of of certain drugs. Yeah. And I think the problem with that is not that drugs are good and that they lied about, you know, dr- drugs being bad, but that by exaggerating it, 
some kid's going to go out and maybe try something and say, oh, they lied to me. What else did they lie about? And then they're that much more likely to try something harder and more terrible for them. Yeah. I think that pupils, students today are smarter. Uh, well, because there's access to Google, so they can check anything. Mm-hmm. And if I look at my students, even... Well, I mean, at, you can uh, Google anything, and, yeah, and it'll kick they back. They do it. They do you, it. You it's, find yourself in an echo chamber, though, yeah. you know? <laughs> they do it, and if you tell them that it's very, uh, you know, if you consume sugar, you know, something will grow on your head, they will check, and they will say, no, you know, you, you're not precise. <laughs> not we, that, we should hope. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think that you have to be realistic. You have to present facts um, and not exaggerate. But I think that if there is enough uh, lessons, not just once a month, maybe on a weekly basis, you know, make it fun, uh, show them movies, maybe take mm-hmm. them out to some uh, field trip in different factories. I think that if you make it fun, slowly, it will sink in. And I think that if you, you just have to show them, you have to tell them, look, you have to explain to them why they consume something sweet in the first place. And when you tell them if you want something sweet, you have these alternatives, which are just as good and maybe even tastier, I think that eventually it will work. But, you know, it's something that you have to do for many, many years, right. uh, probably starting even from grade fourth or fifth grade. I, th- I mean, personally, I would I would even say earlier than that, yeah. you know, the, with the addictive properties of sugar uh, on, you know, on serotonin levels, et cetera. And maybe even limit advertisements. You know, today there are no advertisements for cigarette companies or for cigarettes. Right. Maybe you should also limit uh, advertisements that – you know, uh, hey. try to be attractive to teenagers and so encourage who, them to consume. Well, so who are you talking to in in government, in, in administrative positions to enact some of these labels? And what's maybe some of the pushback that you're getting? Because I, you know, I myself here playing devil's advocate, you know, I can think of a couple arguments in terms of you know, freedom of choice for, you know, if, if nothing else. Yeah. So we haven't we haven't promoted it yet, but uh, mm-hmm. one of the things that we were thinking is maybe turn to the health ministry um, with the um, study results and implications. And I think that the health ministry can take a new position or a novel position and take steps or dr- rather more drastic steps uh, designed to mm-hmm. discourage consumption among kids. You know, I, I'll tell you why I think that kids is where you should start from. Look, you really, it's its hard to change adults' opinions, right? attitudes, and behaviors. If you look at cigarettes with, you know, the organs, which look shocking, right, in Europe, it doesn't discourage current smokers. They're addicted. And many times doctors even say, you know, don't, don't smoke less, especially if you have smoked for a couple of decades because it'll make you, it'll make you yeah, feel terrible. Sure. Yeah, but it does discourage from teenagers getting into the cycle of smoking interesting so maybe you can prevent those who are already addicted to sugar from consuming cookies or whatever it is you know um snack bars but it can prevent uh you know uh, for example i asked my daughter i told i told about my study i told her you know my daughter mika i told listen if if tomorrow we go to a supermarket and there's this sugar uh snack bar that you like chocolate snack bar and there would be these decaying teeth there. Would you continue consuming them? She says, oh, no, daddy. No way. I want to have nice, beautiful white teeth. <laughs> she's just saying that to please you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. You know, it, she's 15. <laughs> yeah, that, that's old enough to not to want your teeth still. Yeah. yeah. Like I feel like if you ask that same question to a five-year-old, just like, mm, they're going to fall out anyway. It's fine. I'll get the big ones, and then I'll stop eating the sugar. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I have to say something. Um, the pictorial label with the yeah. teeth, theoretically, it will work. Our study proves that it works. However, I'm not sure that the Israeli public will be very receptive. Oh, you think it's like the French wine thing? Yes. And I'll tell you why. The Israeli culture is very individualistic. Right. Right. And usually in individualistic societies, consumers don't like it when governments tell them what to do or if they're too aggressive with regulation. So they might say, you know what, we know what to do. We know it's not healthy, and I think we can make our own decisions. And it will be interesting to test this Mm. um, because our study shows that in in cultures where people are very individualistic, they're usually not very receptive, and they don't accept these health warning labels. So that 
so what was the pushback against the current reg the current regulations do you know do you, like what was what how did the public receive the adding of the added salt and the added sugar and the added fat red labels yeah i think it's not really accepted uh, really uh, aggressive and i think that the public has accepted it i think people yeah, have, I, they don't object to it yeah i mean uh, I, you know it doesn't really obscure the the label or the logo or the box very you know again but there's a difference between just having a label with uh, you know a teaspoon of sugar as opposed to something more aggressive, like teeth. a sentence saying, your teeth will fall tomorrow morning. Uh, right. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure they will be receptive, re receptive to this. It will be very, really interesting to have a pilot mm. and see how they react to it. Um, but I think that the pushback was vo more from the industry, um, right. from uh, lobbyists. The industry uh, is going to lose a lot of money because sugar is addictive. And and it's in everything. And it's again, in everything. this takes me back to that to that uh, uh, sugar conspiracy. It's like, oh, well, blame fat. And it's like, all right, great. So now what? Well, we're gonna get rid of fat in all the foods, and now it tastes terrible. And <laughs> we're gonna add sugar, which is the real culprit yeah. all along. You know, sugar is added to everything. Uh, I went to my mom yesterday, mm -hmm. and she says, uh, "I bought these gefilte fish. I'd like you to have them, you know, for dinner." <laughs> And I had them yesterday, and I said, Mom, they're sweet. They're really, yeah. Sugar has been added. And I think that if you reduce the sugar you add into products, usually, uh, eventually, you'll get used to the non-sugar. Look, yeah. sugar's at added first to bread. It's not gonna be ta yeah, at first, it's not going to taste great. F uh, bread without sugar added to it is terrible. It's like eating grass. <laughs> okay? But usually, eventually, you get, you get used to it. I mean, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like chewing a tire. That sounds amazing. Sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you, you're not advertising yourself very well here. Like, ah, oh, you know, I want all of your food to taste like tires. No, <laughs> no, but it's um, it's something you get used to, right? I, I don't know when you have when you have coffee in the morning. How many teaspoons of sugar do you have? Uh, it it depends. Honestly, more often than not, none. In the past, did you have one or two? two, two yeah, totally. But like, but I'll tell you, you know, when I'm at home and I'll make a coffee, I drink it black with no sugar. Okay. So, and that's and most of the coffee I consume is that. Okay. Um, but say for example, this morning, you know, I grabbed a co I grabbed a, a cappuccino from you know from from a place around the studio, and it's you know, for sure, it's there's soy milk in there, which who knows how much sugar has been added to that? I don't know. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is it's a habit. So if mm -hmm. uh, let's say our you know uh, our audience let's say that some of them have two teaspoons of sugar with their coffee or tea, if they reduce it to one and a half, and then after a week to one, and then to half, and then so maybe wean, to zero, wean off. they won't feel it. You won't feel the difference. I used to consume uh, my coffee with two sugar, two teaspoons of sugar, yeah. and now one or even half, and I really don't feel the difference. Mm. So I think it's a habit we can all acquire. You know, habits can be changed. Sure. And I think that if the government gets a little bit more active, let's say, hmm. uh, with limiting advertisements, being, you know, l l pushing a little bit more with the industry, um, I think eventually everybody will be happier. Yeah. The industry will yeah. continue selling and people will continue consuming. I think I think it is really what you said. It's a win-win situation. Earlier. Yeah, I think, I think what you said earlier about how big companies are going to give you the most pushback is uh, is probably accurate. I, I was yeah. thinking back. I think uh, I'm trying to remember which company it was, but they made cranberry juice. And you know, when they when they were told that they had to limit how much sugar they put in there, they said, "Well, you know, it's not palatable <laughs> without without the sugar." Exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, maybe there's something wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, life would be different without sugar, but it's just that we have to consume less. Look, I personally don't think that uh, we shouldn't consume sugar. No, you need a little bit. You need. Okay, you need it, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's you just you that need it's, fat. Yeah, you just but, don't need too much. Exactly. But the thing is that it's excessive. Yeah. Um, do you know how many teaspoons of sugar there is in a one and a half bottle liter of Coke? Oh God, it's like a whole cup or more. It's it's a just an obscene amount. I've seen I've seen the videos. More or less forty teaspoons of sugar. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just obscene. if you consult your nutritionist, he or she will tell you that you should consume up to three teaspoons of sugar a day. So if you invited your friends over for pizza and you had a whole bottle, 
just in one day you consume 10 times as much sugar as you should have it's it's unbelievable. I think that's the thing too. It, it, like when you look at the label now and you see, you know, it's got forty grams of sugar in the bottle. Like you can't, that doesn't say anything to you. You can't you can't picture that. Which exactly. like maybe even more than the rotting teeth. What if you had a picture of the physical representation of that much sugar? Like you know, put it in a measuring cup and put a picture of that on the bottle. Like this is how much sugar is in this thing. Literally. Yes, that could, that is very interesting. That could be a very interesting topic for a follow up study. I'd love to see that to demonstrate how much sugar is in there. Yeah, wow, that, just to be like you know, forget forget the rotting teeth, like because that's it's, it's still that's abstract. That's genius, Aaron. Because it's still abstract to say, oh, it's rotting teeth. Because like you said, my teeth aren't going to fall out tomorrow if I eat this candy or if I eat this cookie or drink this coke. Yeah. But if I see physically that when I drink Absolutely. this coke, I just consumed that much sugar. Yes, that's ingenious. I think that yeah. yeah. All right. You want to be my co-author? I was just going to suggest. Yes. <laughs> All right. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, with that, Vili, thank you so much for joining in. I love I love having you on. And, uh, and uh, you know, when you have the results of this new study, you're welcome back to discuss it. <laughs> thank you. And I just – one more point. I think that we need to distinguish between uh, fructose, mm. which is the natural occurring yeah. sugar, occurring sugar, and the added sugar. Because today, with the standard labeling here in Israel, yeah. the label goes on to when you buy dried mango, for example. Yeah. And I think it could be misleading. Because you say, well, if this is not healthy, then how is it different from a regular chocolate bar? So this is with a lot of sugar, and this is with a lot of sugar. So I may as well have my favorite chocolate bar. I think we need to make a distinction between the two different uh, sugars. I- I'm with you. Absolutely. You know, an apple a day and not a chocolate bar. Apple a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. Or an apple with, you know, covered with a little bit of chocolate. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is a wrap. Billy, again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. I'm Aaron Porras. And for more actually serious topics, remember to like, follow, and subscribe to the podcast on AaronPorras.com, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, No Camels, and Audioversity. We love you. See you next time. Our shows and podcasts available online on our website and on all podcast platforms. Search Audioversity. Clubhouse.